wide circle of life, living circle of love. Plants and trees, seas and rivers, and the blessed sky above. Creatures great, creatures small, one the web that weaves us all in the circle of love. One great circle of life, living circle of love. Plants and trees, seas and rivers, and the blessed sky above. Creatures great, creatures small, one the web that weaves us all in the circle of life. The love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Good morning or good afternoon or whenever you're watching this or engaging this recorded worship service. Greetings and blessings from the United Church of Santa Fe. We're very glad you've joined us for worship in this time. As we begin our time, I invite you to turn off any, anything that might go off during the service, your cell phone, an alarm clock, a watch buzzer, all of those kinds of things, so that you can fully be in the presence of God in this time. And also, um, this is Communion Sunday here at United, and so we will be sharing communion at the end of the service, even when we're apart. If you haven't already, please take a moment and get something to drink, and also uh, some form of bread, crackers, a bagel, a uh, piece of bread, whatever, uh, so that we can share our virtual communion across the miles. Thank you. We also, we're very glad you've joined us for worship. And we also invite you to share in the life and ministry of the United Church in this week ahead. We have a number of educational offerings that, are, uh, that we offer via Zoom, and there's information about that either on the church's website or on, um, by calling the church office or writing us at United Church of Santa Fe, excuse me, United Church SF at gmail.com. We have a very special guest tomorrow evening. Uh, Elijah Hayward is going to be continuing our series on race matters. And that will be a Zoom call. If you're interested, please contact the church office. Elijah is the new executive director of the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. And he will be sharing both his experiences and also what the museum is about in the coming, uh, in the coming years. He will, this will be tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. on Mountain, uh, Mountain Daylight Time. And now, my friends, I invite us to come together and worship as we do every Sunday by taking into our lives God's gifts. So let us take a moment and breathe in God's gift of peace. Let us breathe in God's gift of hope. And let us breathe in deeply God's gift of deep abiding love. Let us gather this day to worship God.
Please join me in our call to worship. Be still and know that God is. God was also in the beginning. And when all human striving has ceased, God will still be. From everlasting to everlasting, God is God and alone is worthy to be worshiped. Let us sing praise to our God. As we prepare to engage God's Word, let us open heart, soul, and mind, and be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, your hopeful people, wait now before you. We would be still. We would listen for your Word speaking in our hearts. Instruct, inspire, and reform us. We pray by the moving of your spirit that we might worship you with gladness and follow your way with zest. Reclaim that which we have caused to go awry. Rescue that which we have put out of place. Forgive that which is amiss. And set us again to our ministries with passionate faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us be together in a time of silent prayer. Beloved brothers and sisters, hear and believe the good news. The one in whom we have our trust is indeed the one whose word speaks in our hearts, whose spirit moves within us and among us, and who offers us gladness and zest, forgiveness and hope, not only for, our own, for ourselves, but also for this whole world. Therefore, let us open heart, soul, and mind to receive all of those abundant gifts that we might be the people God needs us to be and do the works of love and justice this world needs us to do. Let us sing our praise to this powerful God. Great 
circle of life, living circle of love. Plants and trees, seas and rivers, and the blessed sky above. Creatures great, creatures small, one the web that weaves us all in the circle of love. One great circle of life, living circle of love. Plants and trees, seas and rivers, and the blessed sky above. Creatures great, creatures small, one the web that weaves us all in the circle of life. Throughout this summer, we're exploring the question of prayer. What is it? How do we do it? What, is it, what, what happens when we pray? All those kinds of things. And we have some unlikely guides for this study. The family of Sarah, who laughed at God. Abraham, who tried to sacrifice his son. Isaac, who was the sacrificial son. Rebecca, his wife, who cheated him out of giving the right birthright to his older of their, the older of their two sons, Esau. And of course, Jacob, the younger of those two sons. Jacob the trickster, the conniver, the one who came out of the womb grabbing his older brother's heel. Well, we first met Jacob last week when he was on the run. He was on the run from his older brother Esau, from whom he had stolen both birthright and blessing. And now, this Sunday, we meet Jacob again. And he, once again, he is on the run, <laughs> this time from his uncle Laban. It's 20 years later, and after his vision of the ladder of angels out in that wilderness 20 years before, Jacob had con continued on his journey to meet up with his uncle, his mother's brother, and to hopefully be given refuge and shelter there. Well, he got more than he bargained for, because in Laban, he met somebody who was as much a trickster and conniver and as sneaky as he was. Fast forward 20 years and Jacob has gone through all kinds of things. He's been tricked out of two wives, or he's been tricked into marrying the wrong wife and then waiting for the second wife. J Laban has not paid him fairly. Laban has stolen sheep and goats from him. Laban has proved to be as much of a sly trickster as Jacob ever had been. And so in retaliation, <laughs> Jacob has stolen has stolen sheep and goats and also packed up his two wives. And one of those wives, Rachel, has stolen her father's gods. <clears throat> and they are on the run, the whole kit and caboodle. Jacob, Rachel, Leah, all the grandchildren, all the sheep, all the goats. And when Laban finds out, he chases after them. And he is out for bear or for sheep, as the case may be. And when he finally catches up with Jacob, there's a pretty hot exchange between the two of them. But then Laban does something different. And that's where this story begins. The Mansky family is offering us the scripture lesson from the chapter 31 of the book of Genesis. A nephew, an uncle, and an altar of thanks. From the 31st chapter of Genesis. So Jacob arose and set his children, his wives, and all his property on camels, and herded all his livestock, and set out for his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. He deceived his uncle Laban the Aramean, and fled with all that he had, crossing the Euphrates River, and setting his face to Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So with all his kin, he pursued Jacob for seven days, until he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban in a dream and said, Take heed that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. But Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You have deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me? Then Jacob became angry and upbraided Laban. He said to his uncle, What is my offense? These twenty years I have been in your house. I have served you for fourteen years for your daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered Jacob, 
The daughters are my daughters. The children are my children. The flocks are my flocks. And all that you see is mine. But what can I do today about my daughters or about my grandchildren? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be witness to you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsfolk, Gather stone. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. Then Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he called it Galid and the pillar Mizpah. For he said, The Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. If you ill-treat my daughters, though no one else is with us, remember that God is witness between you and me. So early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. And then he departed and returned home. Word of God, word of life. In jazz, in the words of the great jazz musician Miles Davis, when you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that makes it wrong or right. In jazz, when you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that makes it wrong or right. Uncle Laban and nephew Jacob had hit a whole lot of wrong notes in their 20 years together. They'd cheated each other, they'd used each other, they'd used daughters, they'd used wives, they'd used grandchildren, they'd used sheep and goats. They had hit a lot of wrong notes, these two conniving uncle and nephew. <clears throat> and at this time that we hear that we meet them, it feels like they are, they're about ready to have a whole cacophony of wrong notes come crashing down around them. Imagine Jacob and Laban facing one another in the scene that the Manskys just read. The two men are probably not keeping social distance. They're probably in each other's faces. Their faces are probably red. They're as angry as a cat thrown into a river. <laughs> they've probably got, they've, they've, they're remembering all the grievances they have against one another. And probably I would imagine that if they don't have their hand on their sword or spear, they've got a good, good solid rock in their hands ready to throw it at each other. They have hit a lot of wrong notes and they're continuing to do so. But then, but then Laban does something different. He strikes a different chord. He hits, plays a different note. He steps back just a bit and he listens. He listens to Jacob's anger and the anguish un underneath it. Jacob says to his uncle, for 20 years I have labored. I have tended your sheep and your goats, and not a single ewe has miscarried. Not a single ram has died. I've cared for your two daughters, my beloved wives, and their children. And you have never paid me the right wages. In fact, you have cheated me out of ten times as much as I have worked for. No wonder it's payback time for those, all those lost paychecks. And one would think that Laban, you could also imagine, you could imagine Laban standing there, his fist clenching around that rock that he's holding, his face getting even more red, his, up, his blood pressure going sky high as he remembers what it is he wants to say next. But instead, he does something different. He strikes a different note. He finally says to his nephew, I remember the covenant between us. I remember that your wives are my daughters. Your children are my grandchildren. We are all in this thing together. And then he remembers something else. He remembers a deeper covenant, not just the one between himself and Jacob and Jake and their shared family. But he remembers the covenant both he and Jacob has with God, the giver of life. His life, Jacob's life, his daughters' and grandchildren's lives, all life. 
He remembers that covenant. And as he does, his grip around that stone eases up. And instead of using that stone to throw at his nephew, he takes that stone and it becomes the first stone in an altar to remember that covenant. And together, he and Jacob, Jacob probably with the stone or the rock he had in his own hand, build an altar of thanks, an altar of covenant, and an altar of remembrance. And no, these two men are never going to be best buddies. <laughs> they can't even agree on the name of the place where they are standing. And yes, they will go their separate ways, but always, always, there will be that altar of thanksgiving, that altar that reminds them of the covenant that they have with one another as part of the family, and the covenant they have, most importantly, with the, with the God who created both of them. Because, my friends, when we remember that covenant, when we remember that covenant that you and I each have with God, then we also have to remember the covenant that we have with one another as children of that God. And we have to remember the covenant that we have with the whole human family, the people with whom we share life in this church, the people with whom we share life in our human families, the people with whom we share life in this community of Santa Fe or in this nation or in this world, because God has a covenant with them too. And when we remember, when we remember the covenant we have with God, then we also remember the covenant we have with one another across all those lines of race and class and background and all those things that divide us. That's what Laban remembered. That's what he remembered that day. And I think that's why, as he heard his nephew's anguish and his anger, that he was able to stand there and decide to strike a different note to use that rock that he had in his hand to build an altar, a remembrance of that covenant with Jacob and with God. That is not easy to do. That kind of commitment is probably one of the most difficult things we have to do, we need to do in our lives. And we don't know what really motivated Laban that day. But maybe as we, just, as we talked about a couple weeks ago from a quote of Viktor Frankl's that between our res the stimulus and the response, if we let God into that space, then maybe we make a different decision. Maybe we play a different note. Maybe a stone that we might use to harm another becomes instead a stone to build an altar of thanks. We don't know what prayer Laban said in that moment that enabled him to hear his nephew Jacob, perhaps for the first time, all that anguish, all that anger. But we do know, we do know that there are prayers we offer, that we can offer, that can change our response that can fill that space between us and another and change an angry response into a remembrance, a remembrance of the covenant that we have with that other person or other communities, other peoples, and especially the covenant we have with God. Every single Sunday and in other times when we gather even apart as a church, we close our time together with a remembrance of that covenant. We close that time together with a, with a benediction that's based on the writings of the letter of Paul the Apostle to the United Church of Rome thousands of years ago. We remember that God calls us, that part of our covenant with God is to be in this world in peace, go out into this world in peace. And that that covenant with God means we have a covenant with one another 
be it in this church or in our places of work or our families or with other communities, other peoples in this nation that enables us to, yes, be in this world in peace and to have the courage and commitment it takes to listen to another's anguish and anger. To be in this world in peace and to have courage. To hold on to what is good. To return no one evil for evil. To strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering. Honor all persons, honor all creation. Each week we remind ourselves of that covenant we have with all of God's children. And we remind ourselves, too, of the covenant God has with each of us and all of us. That the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit will be with us, now and always. May that benediction, that benediction that calls us to rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit, be a reminder of our covenant with God and with one another so that when our fists might clench around a stone we want to throw or our voices get clenched wanting to speak an angry word that instead we can step back and listen listen to the anguish and anger of another and let those stones become the first part of an altar of benediction an altar of the covenant. That to love God means to love our brothers and sisters across all that divides the human race, the human family. To listen to God at work in our lives is to listen to our brothers and sisters. How hard, even if that is very hard. To trust in God is to trust that we can play a different note that will make the notes we've played before be right. To trust in God is to play a different note this day, this week, this year, and to trust that God will help us play those right notes in all the days, weeks, and years to come. The covenant we have with God is the basis of our covenant with one another. And when we hit wrong notes, either in the past or now, may we trust God enough to help us hit, to play the right note. Thanks be to God. Amen.
My friends, we gather at this table to share bread and cup. We gather in our own homes or wherever we might be to share symbols of that bread and cup. Symbols of a new covenant. A covenant that Jesus made not only with those 12 disciples that night, one who would betray, one who would deny, and all the rest who would fall away, but a covenant that God remade with all of us, no matter our background, no matter our divisions, no matter who we are or what we have done. For we come to the table, my friends, and we share a story that on that night of betrayal and death, the one we know as Lord and Savior Jesus Christ sat at table with those 12 disciples. They all came from different backgrounds. They all had different understandings. They all would do different things. But in the midst of the meal, he took bread. And when he had blessed it and given thanks for it, he broke the bread. And he gave it to them, to all of them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, my friends, when we share the broken bread, wherever we may, wherever we may be, we remember how God comes to us in the brokenness of our world and the brokenness of our lives, feeds our deep hungers, and creates wholeness and hope once again. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And again, when he had blessed it and given thanks for it, he gave it to them and he said, Take, drink, this cup is the cup of the new and everlasting covenant poured out for all people, for the forgiveness of sins and the newness of life. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, my friends, when we share this cup, we do so to remember, to remember the ways in which God's love is poured out upon us and in us and through us, and God's love is poured out upon all people and in all people and through all people, indeed, through all creation. And so when we drink from this cup and we share this bread, or we share the symbols of bread and cup, we do so to remember, to remember how God's covenant of love overcomes our fear, how God's covenant of hope with us and all creation overcomes our despair, how God's covenant of life overcomes all of our ways of death. So it is in that spirit that I invite us to keep this feast and to share these gifts of bread and cup. Following the prayer of consecration, we will share however it is possible for you in whatever setting you're in, the bread. That will be followed by a time of silence, blessed by music, and then we will share the cup. But however it is we share, whatever kind of bread or beverage or cup you're using, whatever you have done or not done, whatever this meal means to you, know that you are welcomed at this table. In that spirit, let us give thanks to God and welcome one another. My beloved friends, this table is open to all who seek to know God's love and to follow in God's ways of love and justice. We share in this communion to receive bread for our journey and the cup of mercy. And we come to this table not because we must, but because we may. We come not because we are fulfilled, but because we stand in need of God's mercy and assurance. We come not to express an opinion, but to share a presence and to seek a presence. And so therefore, let us come to this table, my brothers and sisters, as we are. This meal is offered for you and me, that we might again know that God has come to us, offered us, <coughs> excuse me, God has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling all creation to our Creator. Let us be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of all places, present unseen, voice in our silence, song in our midst, God of the next note, God of the next day, God of the coming years. 
We are your people, knowing and unsure. Come, O Lord, bless this feast of bread and cup, and bless us who share. God of all dreaming, near and yet far, vision of heard of, wake us to rest. You call us to be your presence, sent forth, of, sent forth unafraid. Come, God of all peoples, come and share this feast. God of all people, dust in the clay, breath of a new wind, fire in our heart, light born of heaven, peace on the earth. Come, O Lord, come with that fire and that spirit, come with that new wind, come with your presence. Bless this bread and this cup and all the symbols we might use this day and bless each of us and all of us and bless this whole world with your love that overcomes our fear, your healing and wholeness that overcome our brokenness, your hope that overcomes our despair and your life that overcomes our death. All this we pray, not only for ourselves, but for this world that you so love. And we pray it in the name of the one who is the host at this feast, who showed us your ways of love, love that is powerful enough to overcome division and even death itself. For it is in the name of the risen Christ that we offer our lives and our prayers to you, speaking to you with boldness, courage, and most of all trust that he has taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My beloved brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, broken and given for us and for all creation. Let us share this bread. My friends, this is the cup of the new covenant that quenches all thirst. May we who are thirsty enough share this cup together. Let us be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Life-giving God, we give you thanks for the gift of this table, the bread, the cup, the presence of Christ, and most of all, communion with you. Through these gifts, you empower us to be the new community of love, 
hope, and justice. Give us the courage and commitment to live up to that calling, to be in this world in peace, to have courage, and to trust your presence in our lives and in all life. We pray in your name. Amen. Let us join in our song of thanksgiving. And now, my friends, I bid you to go out into this world and be in this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Honor all creation. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that spirit be with us all. Be in peace. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>